I'm Michael Burke and this is Money Talks. Hi, welcome to Money Talks, the Journal Times online business show. I'm business reporter Michael Burke. Um, it's often said that there are only two certainties in life, death and taxes, and we're going to talk about one of those today with Ann Meredith from Marsh Meredith and Eklam Funeral Home, right on the edge of downtown, uh, 803 Main Street, yep. right? Uh, your specialty there is what? Pre-need, I, I do all pre-planning of funerals. Okay, and that's Which today's are. topic about mm -hmm. the the reasons a person would want to do that and what that entails. So, uh, before we start on that, how long have you been in the business? Um, I'm going into my ninth year. I started in 2005. And that's a family family business. Right? Yes, I work with my four brothers, uh, funeral directors. I work with my sister Susan, who does all the administrative work behind the scenes, and my dad Tom Meredith. So you've got about six people involved in here? Yes. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure there were that many. Um, so what's your uh, your title is pre-need specialist. Is yes. that how mm -hmm. you say that? Yeah, pre-need specialist. I pretty much created that title because I think of there's only two times, Mick, that you can even plan a funeral. At the time of need or pre-need. So I'm like pre-need specialist. I mean, just, just to be yeah. real clear, yeah. at the time of need, by that you mean after the death has occurred. Correct. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Which is probably... Some people sort of probably barge into that then because they haven't done it the other way. They haven't done it ahead of time, right? Correct. And I mean, it hasn't been all that prevalent. Maybe that's been one of the largest changes in the funeral industry is how prevalent that's become. And um, my whole objective is to try to get out into the community and educate people on the importance of pre-planning a funeral. You do a lot of public speaking on this, Yes, I do. To yeah. civic groups and things like that? Totally. And churches or any kind of senior group or any group um, at all. My average age I pre-range is 60, so it's not like I'm really trying to pre-range people that are up in age, like in their late 80s. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that about the age when people start to think about this and come in to see you? Absolutely, because good financial planners will always say, well, have you done your funeral planning yet? And um, because all funeral homes don't do a price guarantee um, where we can guarantee the funeral goods and service of the funeral home, we do. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you can, if everyone's going to have a funeral and a funeral bill and you pre-range earlier in life, I mean, it is quite a savings. You do save money. Well, we we'll get back to the finances okay. of it later, but that that's a good point to recall and uh, bring up again. Um, okay, some of this may be sort of obvious, but you know, one of the things that strikes me is if you don't pre-plan, and let's say your your father or mother dies, then you've got the children there, and you're trying to pick out the casket, and you're trying to figure out burial versus cremation. You're trying to figure out a lot of things at a really emotional time, right? You know, Mick, you nailed it on the spot there because. Um, one of the main reasons people pre-plan is so you never have to second guess, you know, wishes for your loved ones. So I mean, if if you can make it known, make your wishes known. I mean, just think of what a great gift of love that is for your family. I can really imagine that scene too, because you know you're going to have you know, the practical sister and the and then the brother who says, oh, you know, mom deserve would deserve the finest, and you're going to have squabbles and things like that, wouldn't you potentially? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, I know especially larger families. I mean, everybody has a different economic point of their career, and like you say, it eliminates all of that financial burden that you're leaving for your family. And imagine the one that has. You know, like, oh, I love mom so much, they might emotionally overspend, mm -hmm. you know. Do you feel like there's any, uh, or ever was in your industry, um, funeral directors that might have taken advantage of that? Well, I certainly hope not. I mean, quite yeah. honestly, I know my family, our whole business is built on integrity. So, mm -hmm. um, like any industry, there's a bad apple in the bunch, but no, I, I can't imagine in our firm. Mm -hmm. we try, our whole, you know... Um, place in the communities to help people. I mean, mm -hmm. our whole business is just service orientated. Yeah. Um, so if somebody comes in now, they've made an appointment with you to do pre-planning, let's start with something really basic. 
do you do that at the funeral home, or what are the options? Whatever their choice is, the whole my idea is to make them feel very comfortable. So if they're more comfortable talking in their own um, kitchen at their home, I'm happy to go to their home. It takes about an hour to do pre-planning. So, but if they want to come down to the funeral home, I like to showcase our building mm -hmm. and have coffee and Kringle at the funeral home. And I think you know people then become feeling comfortable with. Uh, funeral home. And you could sort of envision then, well, this is what the layout would be. Right. You know, at that I, time. I walk them through the steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, walk us through, through the steps. When you start this session, uh, what's the first thing that you say? Well, um, First off, you know, I try to, you know, <laughs> make sure that the person's feeling comfortable and I um, want to interview them. So I say I'd like to interview you like a Barbara Walters interview. And I think people love to talk about themselves naturally. And I have a funeral file that I need to get filled out. And it starts with vital statistics. And you might say, well, why do we need all that information? You know, when I ask you your father's name, mother's maiden name, and you're going, wow, she's really probing. Now she wants my social security. We need all this information for a death certificate someday. So imagine if you can give me all that information in advance, uh, how wonderful that is at the time of your death when the grieving family comes in, the worst day of your children's life, and my sister Susan now, at the time of your death, one of my brothers will pull out your file, let's say you die in your sleep at two in the morning, um, my brothers will go to the file room, pull your file out, and my sister Susan, then when she gets to work in the morning, she'll start typing up an obituary. Mm -hmm. Also, this information will be needed for a death certificate, just like you have a birth certificate. So we need all that information to be accurate, and it's easier for me to ask the person while you're alive to tell me about your life. It makes a lot of sense that you would gather as much as possible for the obituary. Um, it's a little surprising to me that a death certificate would require so much information. Oh, definitely. Even a question like demographics, like what's your highest level of education, you know, or what would you like for your job title, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, a lot of times, imagine if you hadn't done this, now your children have to come up with this information. Yeah. I mean, you know, they don't quite remember the year you retired or sure. um, maybe don't remember the middle name of your mother's name and all this, but we want it to be accurate, just like your birth certificate. But more importantly, I think when I interview you is the time where you can personalize your funeral. You know, uh, you can share with me uh, what your ideas are and we can discuss options in that. But to personalize it down to where, for example, what your memorial, uh, where do you want memorial contributions? Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to select your songs. Uh, maybe you'd like to uh, pick scripture reading, a special poem, anything that is going to help um, the clergy that day that you die. Maybe, um, maybe your clergy doesn't know you very well. I give you a book that you'll have rest of your life to fill out or ponder over. And one of the pages in the book, and I, you know, it's so poignant. It says, how do you wish to be remembered? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, everyone, you know, we all like to kind of avoid uh, conversations on funeral and whatever, but none of us are going to avoid it, you know, the result, the <laughs> result, right? I mean, our own mortality. I mean, uh -huh. it's just something no one's going to escape. So, um, you mentioned how you'd like to be remembered. Um, when somebody comes to you to have this conversation, what should they bring with them? Should they bring any photos or anything like that? Um, well, sometimes people are that prepared, but you know, quite honestly, not most of the time. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'll suggest you know that they find their most favorite photo that they love. So, on the worst day of your kid's life, they're not rummaging through photos. Um, imagine the deadline we have with the Racine Journal Times, where we've got to get all this information over here in a photo so that it can run in the newspaper. Um, but great, great point with the photo. Not only that, our um, firm we have kind of a unique. Um, product, we do what we call a life panel. And a life panel is, you know, so you're 88 years old when you pass away, I don't want someone just to be remembered as a senior citizen. Mm -hmm. We'd like to remember you as, like when you were a little boy, middle age, maybe you mm -hmm. were in the service, and we put all these photos together and put a nice panel together so that um, it's a nice, you know. I've been to Wakes where they had these fantastic boards of you know, many, many, many different photos. And uh, I always think, wow, someone really planned ahead here. Somebody really, really was organized and knew where to find these things. Mm -hmm. um, is Now that's, I'm sure, something the family does, but you say you could take 
what, five, six different photos and make this light panel? Right, right. And it, it's um, blown up, so it's quite large. And then we give as a gift to the family a smaller version, and if they'd like to buy more. But it's professionally framed, and um, it, it's just beautiful. It's been a big hit. But it isn't just the light panel. We also do the life story. Um, which has shelf life. We have a professional writer where now we'll gather 25 pictures so when you come in, let's say maybe you don't even know um, the deceased very well, you're there to you know give your sympathy to the son of the mother, um, you could read about uh, his mm. mother while you're waiting in uh, the visitation line. Mm. Um, but that's been really um, very well received in our community and it's neat because it's got shelf life so it passes down through generations oh, yeah. and um, we just want to try to personalize funerals as much as we can. Yeah, um, let's start with some of the really fundamental decisions. Uh, one is cremation versus burial. So when somebody comes to you, do they usually have a pretty definite idea which route they want to go? or Not always. You, uh -huh. Not always. Good question, Mick. You know, because a lot of times I'll ask people, have you made any end-of-life decision? And they'll say, well, you know, we have a, a ground burial plot we purchased out at our Catholic cemetery or West Lawn or one of the city cemeteries. And I'll say, well, um, so probably when you purchased that, it wasn't for real estate before you were thinking of a traditional funeral. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, we have, you know, half and half of where people are leaning towards cremation or traditional. But I think when I walk them through, you know, the price points, and let's say, for example, they want a traditional funeral, it's not like they have to go to a casket room. I have all my caskets that they can view right on my iPad. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. I have a book they can flip through. But it's just like purchasing any, any kind of a product. It's amazing how there's... When, especially ladies, you know, they have very, they have more choices than guys. I don't know, you know, it's just how it is. And they'll just find the right appropriate casket but it, that fits their budget. And uh -huh. I think that's what they can create, that they can design the funeral that fits their budget and they're not leaving anyone with a financial burden. That, that question about uh, cremation versus burial, you know, one thing that strikes me is uh, with burial, you're always going to know where to go see your mom or dad's grave. What do you tell people in the case of cremation what kinds of options are there? You don't have to go through all of them, but give some ideas what people do in, yeah. the, in, the, in that case. You know, um, and I do believe our society, you know, we're becoming much more of a disposable society. So when people say cremation, the first thing that I ask them, I say, well, who will receive your ashes? Mm -hmm. You know, because I don't want them to think that after the funeral or the, you know, we have the cremains. Someone has to take those ashes. Mm -hmm. We're not a cemetery. Yeah. And, you know, what, I'm no judge of what people's opinions are. You know, if they want to have their um, ashes scattered, you know, I mean, is it legal? Not particularly. Um, do oh, people, it's not. Well, not, no. You so just can't go want, sprinkle I, them in Lake Michigan, but it happens, right? So it's not... Um, well, what if someone tells you, let's just pursue that for a second. If, let's say someone tells you, my favorite place in the world is Bong Recreation Area, and I'd like them scattered in, you know, in a prairie there. What do you tell them? Can you well, put that I in writing? I them? tell them. I say that. Well, it's not legal. Okay. You know. So, but I mean, I'm not there to witness. So then they have to you know, make a side deal with the family. But we'll be, <laughs> we'll be giving the ashes to the family, and uh -huh. you know. Um, but I do know, like canon law reads, your ashes should go back to a sacred place. So that mm. would be the cemetery. Mm -hmm. So there are niches people can. You know, uh, we have beautiful cemeteries in our city. They can go. Um, you know, tour the property to see if they, maybe the ashes want to go in a niche or they could go into a ground. You can have, most cemeteries have different specifications, but mm -hmm. they pretty much all say two cremains can go in one um, plot. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. What are some of the other decisions, you know, after the life story? So now you've got the obit and the death certificate kind of lined up. What are some of the other decisions after the basic ones like burial versus cremation and okay. what, what casket? And by the way, what's the difference between casket and coffin? Oh, it's the same thing. Same thing? Oh, yeah, okay. It's They're just probably, you okay. know, that's a good one. Yeah, it's just probably coffin is a little bit more old-fashioned. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like Transylvania or something, doesn't it? No. <laughs> but anyways, yeah. I thought maybe one was a just, casket. I thought maybe yeah. coffin just meant a wooden. No, but there's two dust. types of caskets. We have wood caskets and we have metal caskets. And we have all price points. So when somebody mm -hmm. says, you know, I just want to keep it very, you know, um, within this budget, you know, we have three tiers of pricing. They can select what fits their budget. Um, okay. 
So what about after those basic decisions, uh, like yep. burial versus cremation, and what are some of the other Well, other then um, we talk about, you know, for example, if they'd like to have a church funeral or if they'd mm. like everything at the funeral home. Yeah, that's a pretty know. basic decision to make. Yeah, you know. and they don't have to, you know, um, some people say, well, what if I'm not looking good at 103? I'm going to be asking mm. you, who mm. is going to be your informant? That would be the person that would be in charge of your funeral that you're going to appoint because by state law my sister has to itemize that funeral bill at the time of the person's death so even when somebody says to me well Ann well, what if I buy a casket and I you know I'm my body I was in a fire or something happened mm -hmm. uh, you know by state law it protects the consumer then if you don't get a casket or the vault and you don't end up with a traditional funeral or you've changed your mind then that money that's in the burial insurance trust would end up going back to the family the beneficiary your mm -hmm. estate Mm -hmm. Now, if you were on Title 19, then any extra funds would go back to the state of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And so one decision is open or closed uh, coffin or casket? Correct, right. But Just like a decision, you know, you think about if you're wearing glasses, are your glasses on or off? Oh, yeah. Or like if you're going to be buried in a suit or casual wear or your Green Bay Packer wear, right? Yeah, well. um, all of these decisions, because imagine that day that you pass away, someone, the grieving family is going to come into the funeral home and they're going to need to bring all of these items down mm. to your underclothing, mm. shoes, everything. So, mm. um, uh -huh. so the type of service, uh, what you'll be wearing, all yeah. your clothes, what are, the music yeah. you mentioned. Yeah, music. For example, if you love country western music during your visitation, we'd love to have that playing. You could pick your songs. Um, I have a brother that does a phenomenal job with videos, and a lot of times he puts it to all your songs that you love. Mm. Um, and people love that as a keepsake. Mm -hmm. um, so we just try to do, to make it so that it's a true celebration of your life. Huh? As you're going through this hour-long process of planning, what what are people's moods typically like coming in and, and then during that hour? Does it change at all? Mac, it changes dramatically. When they come in, I can just tell, you know, that they're nervous. I mean, who wants to talk about dying, you mm -hmm. know? I mean, I'd love to think that I'm more of a wedding planner than a funeral planner, but, you know, I just love to be able to disarm all that nervousness and make the people feel comfortable. They're laughing, they're having a nice time, um, and they really enjoy it. And they're so grateful, I'm telling you. Every time people are so grateful when they leave I can and that. they have that yeah, done. Yeah, you know? it's behind you and yeah, all lined up. But they're just, but, you know, they even come back and revisit their files. Imagine, I don't own your files at Marsh Meredith and Akron Funeral Home. We house them there. You own your files. So let's say you move away, you move down to Florida, um, you're older, um, by law you own that, you retain the right to change your designated funeral firm. So we have to mail that file to the mm -hmm. funeral home that you would choose. And I always say that to people, you know, they say, well what if you guys um, are out of business? Now, I can't ever ex imagine that happening. Mm -hmm. happening. My dad's been in business over 55 years and uh -huh. I've got a whole family coming yeah. up through it. But um, your, your funeral policy, which your money is housed in, is um, irrevocable and permanent and can be transferred to any funeral home across the United States. So let's talk about the money just a little bit more. Now, mm -hmm. How does a person go about fi financing a funeral and because you pre-planned, does that mean you have to plunk down money ahead of no, time? No, absolutely not. It's entirely up to you. Um, nine out of ten people do, all because of the fact that we do a guarantee. I think when they are in the mode of thinking of pre-planning their funeral, they really want to do the whole complete funeral. Uh -huh. um, you're not writing a check to Marsh, Meredith, and Aquin Funeral Home. That's against the law. I am not giving you anything today but a mm -hmm. cup of coffee and Kringle, right? Okay. So we have to put your money into a vehicle. We choose a vehicle that's a burial insurance trust that's permanent and irrevocable. We use a particular company. They used to be part of the Batesville Casket Company in ba Batesville, Indiana, but their core line of insurance is working with funeral homes all across the United States. A rated company. So now you have a burial insurance policy. You might say, well, Anna, I have another personal insurance. Yeah, how does I'll that work if you have like yeah, insurance? Well, if you have like, say, a prudential policy, that particular policy you can use for your funeral at the time of your death, but you'll get the pricing at that particular oh, year that you I die. See. So the part that I can guarantee is for the funeral goods and service. So you're itemizing your funeral bill. Then we'll add on the non-guarantee. Those are all the items that people 
um, maybe you know they don't think about the cost of that like the Racine Journal Times obituary we're mm-hmm. going to charge per line mm-hmm. an average obituary is 350 oh, yeah. um, when I, I always tell people when I give a speech I say if you see those big long obits read them those are like a thousand dollars you know <laughs> but um, you know it's a profit center right but also non guaranteed cash advance items are things like opening and closing of the grave or the crypt mm-hmm. or the niche at the cemetery mm-hmm. um, flowers Flowers, yeah. right? You might build in just for the casket spray or two bouquets for an altar. A casket spray average cost maybe three fifty. Mm-hmm. Um, you'll build in for death certificates. You might even put down um, funds estimated amount for lunch. You know why that's terrific? Imagine at the time of your death, no one's going to argue about, wow, did uh, Mick want to have a luncheon party after whatever? Yeah, you you said you want to have some camaraderie. You mm-hmm. want people to share and exchange stories. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So, um, what's a typical range of cost for the, the whole thing? And then, if you do want to lock in as many items as possible, so you buy this policy on the front end, then your your life insurance, if you have that, then it'll just you'll just designate that to go to the family at the time or something like that. Correct. Right? Or you could use you can piecemeal your funeral together however you'd like. If you'd like to use personal insurance to pay any cash advance items, you could do that. Hmm. Or you can always come back and add on to your burial insurance trust. So you don't have to do everything mm-hmm. up front, but I mean every year that you wait, it's just going to cost you more money. Mm-hmm. And we do know you're going to have that funeral and that funeral bill. So in today's dollars, what is the range of costs? Okay, for a traditional funeral, just an average casket, uh, you'll have the funeral service fee, the average casket, and let's say you have a ground burial, and so your casket okay. has to go into a vault, and all the cash advances added on um, will be ten grand. Okay. Approximately ten grand. And how does that change if you're cremated? Um, and then if you want to have, there's three types of cremation services. So the one type is called a traditional cremation. And a traditional cremation means your body is going to be present at your funeral. So okay. all funeral homes don't do, um, don't have like a rental casket. Now we feel that well, we we own our own crematory, but we wouldn't uh, want. So you're renting the casket because the person's going to be. Uh, cremated, cremated after the funeral. Uh-huh. Okay. So we have a rental casket, okay. you know, and a nice wood rental casket. So mm-hmm. you're buying the interior part of a casket. Uh-huh. Um, so if you have that traditional cremation, the total uh, price will come to about $6,500. Mm-hmm. The next type of cremation is memo- uh, memorial cremation. Have you ever been to a funeral where there's no body present? And there's maybe an urn might be an urn, or maybe we just have, have a big life panel or a big picture of you know, someone blown up or mm-hmm. a couple bouquets. That's called a memorial cremation, and that'll come to about four grand. And in that case, the person was cremated ahead of time. Cremated before, right? And now uh-huh. it's just a you know celebration of their life. Okay. Maybe people get up and speak, um, music, singers, that type of thing. And then mm-hmm. the um, least expensive is the direct cremation. And a direct cremation is like people maybe don't have a church affiliation. Um, they might not not have family. Um, but they're still charged to that, and it's mm. um, shy of two thousand dollars at our firm. Okay. 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 And that includes everything: the crematory fee, the medical examiner fee, because you need to have a medical examiner in Racine County. Mm-hmm. To, yeah. uh, last question uh, is: um, we've talked about costs, and clearly there are a lot of decisions to be made. But as a person is educating themselves about all of this, do people comparison shop? Do you? Yeah. What do you think of comparison shopping? Yeah, I you know I encourage it. I mean, you know, I hope to earn their business, but the fact mm-hmm. of the matter is, you know, um, it's like anything. It's a large ticket item. Mm-hmm. I mean, if at every funeral home, by law, has to be able to provide you with a general price sheet. Um, I'm always pleasantly surprised when people do that. They come back, and, mm-hmm. you know, they do know we have different price points to mm-hmm. help them with, you know, the budget that they want to stay within. How many funerals do you typically do in a month's time? Oh, well, that varies. Well, I'm sure. Um, that really or a varies. year's time. Well, yeah, I have an idea. Probably um, north of 400. But, you know, my brothers, as the funeral directors, they'd be able to, Mm -hmm. you know, and it varies, you know. Yeah, okay. So. Uh, well, Ann Meredith, thanks a lot for, it was a really educational uh, conversation, well, thank I think. Thanks for being on Money Talks. You've been watching Money Talks, the Journal, Journal Times online business show. I'm business reporter Michael Burke. Thanks for watching. <laughs>